Today, I'm going to talk about a couple of examples of artistic research with or on or through replicas of archaeological finds. And before I do so and get started, I want to say that I do this from the perspective that I'm interested in, not so much actually about the distant past, because I think I can contribute less to that, but I'm really interested in the interrelation of archaeology and popular culture. So interest in how archaeology, uh, archaeology has filtered into popular culture, but also how popular culture, also visual art, has transformed archaeological objects, images, subjects, appropriated them, uh, used them, and maybe that's possibly something we can discuss has filtered back or fed back into archaeological um, discourse. Um, so why do I call my the title of my presentation Doppelganger? I think that many of the or some of the examples that you will hear about they have been understood as criticism on, on museums in a certain way. Museums institutions have felt um, sometimes attacked by these um, practices. But I think if we fully want to understand their relevance, their role and their, their um, productive potential, we need to understand them in a certain way. And the doppelganger for me is the concept that I used to try to understand them. Um, the doppelganger was a term that became really popular in romantic literature. Um, and in short terms, the doppelganger there served as an agent of destabilization or deterioration of a subject's identity. So the doppelganger was accompanied by the fear that through repetition and especially in, uh, or in particular the encounter of a subject with its double, the self would be getting lost. Uh, Sigmund Freud, in his essay, The Uncanny, from 1919, explained that the doppelganger triggers a feeling of what he called the uncanny. And he described the uncanny as the name for everything that ought to have remained hidden and secret and has now become visible. Okay, so that sounds very negative, destructive in a way, but Freud, in the same essay, he's also pointing at a more positive quality of the doppelganger because he says, and I quote, the fact that a faculty of this kind exists, which is able to treat the rest of the ego like an object, a fact that is that man is capable of self-observation, renders it possible to invest the old idea of a double with a new meaning and to ascribe many things to it, above all those things which seem to the new faculty of self-criticism. So that's the angle I would like to propose to look at these um, examples and to read them as a kind of interruption um, and a way of distancing between the past and the present. And I think we have also heard the other argument that we should not have too much distance, but today I would like to argue for that distance and to see what that allows us to do in the, in the present day in terms of self-observation and self-reflection. So no matter how far my examples sometimes deviate from the originals of finds or how dangerously close they might sometimes come, I would like to argue to view these replicas as important on their own right to understand the importance and the impact of archaeology on contemporary discourse on popular cultures and vice versa. Okay, we have seen this example a couple of times today, and I think most of you will um, will know it. For those who don't, let me try to give you a um, brief introduction. Ah, here we go. Um, so this is a work by um, Nora Albadri and Jan Nicolai Nellis, and, and that was really becoming prominent in 2015, 2016. Um, what they did was that they claimed to have created um, a scan of the Nefertiti bust at the Neues Museum in Berlin. Um, and subsequently, they exhibited 3D prints of the Nefertiti in Egypt and also in several European countries. So you can see um, here. Following these exhibitions in 2016, they um, kind of restituted which is buried a uh, 3D print of that bust in the desert outside of Cairo as a counteract to the excavation, as they called it. So here, the replica in their terms questions le the legitimacy of museums as national institutions in Germany and also in Egypt, because they were 
deliberately not wanting to restitute to a museum in Egypt, but they said this is a common um, property of, of mankind that should, um, because it's a property of a lost civilization and cannot be fully represented by a modern nation state. As I said, it gained a lot of um, international reputation and it was mainly viewed as an act of decolonial activism targeted at the museum. However, what I would like to point out, and I think others, including Haiti guys, might have done that too, is that it's um, that it's part of a discussion on digital culture, not so much on the on the material culture of the object itself, because what the artists were doing was mainly targeting the museum's digital strategy, because the museum in 2000, I think, um, eight or something like that, they had commissioned a 3D scan by Trigon Art, a commercial company, and they used this scan as a basis for new replicas that were sold for nearly 9,000 uh, euro through their famous Gipsformerei uh, replication workshop. But um, also they kept, of course, they kept the copyright of this digital scan and despite of many uh, claims uh, or public interest in that scan, they never made it publicly available under a kind of um, open uh, um, a public domain or a Creative Commons license. So, as I said, much of the public debate around the Nefertiti was centered about matters of ownership and copyright versus copyleft of museum objects and the decolonial discourse of restitution and repatriation. Although restitution and repatriation, as I said before, are two, for, for the artists, are two different um, things here because they would deliberately not repatriate to a, um, to a nation state. However, if we listen to the artist's own words, we find a description denoting the quality of the replica in its own right, in its own immateriality. And I quote here, the object was not a strict copy as a perfectly painted replica, which only mimics the original, but as cultural storage we just not try to conceal its origin as a technological reproduction, but embraces the value of the inherent um, information. So what is this inherent information? To me, it seems that here we can find the location of Freud's uncanny. It's a demarcation of the ancient material object and modern as well as contemporary narratives associated with it. And I will continue about this here, because this, for, uh, for me, proved more interesting than the actual copy and the discussion on if it was perfect or who owned the copy, because this is uh, what how the, the so-called um, 3D online community reacted when um, Albadrian Nellis released their data into the public domain and other individuals and groups started to work with the Nefertiti data. So, there were diverse reactions, a lot of a spectrum, and I have to admit that I created some bias here by my selection of these um, responses. But what you can easily see, um, the Nefertiti's 3D scan was tailored to a lot of times very contemporary and critical discourses of race or racism and gender um, identity, as you can see on these images, especially on the large um, one. Now, it's of course very easy to renounce such an appropriation as purely ideological and unsubstantiated by any academic research into Nefertiti's actual ancient personality. However, I would like to point out that Nefertiti as a museum object has been and is still part of complex and evolving narrative of nation states, for example, e Egypt and Germany, their modern formation, colonialism, etc. So the Nefertiti has a layered biography already. It has um, a biography before she was found in 1912. It has a biography between 1912 and the 2000s, where, and, and it has a present day a biography as well that stretches into the digital and then creates a, a different kind of discourse. So what I think is that what the artists are really doing with this work is that they are activating a discourse by, as they did, and with their claim of um, keeping her in this digital 
materiality clearly marking a difference from the material copy because the, the Prussian Heritage Foundation, of course, sells perfect copies based on that scan that are almost, you cannot make a difference on a first glance to the, to the original, so perfect um, are these copies. So I think that instead of what usually happens with these replicas is to aim for perfection and recreate the so-called identity of the object, what the artists were aiming at is understand it as a potentiality of diversity of the object. Now I would like to come to two examples from a project, a major research project by myself that I did between 2016 and 18 that continues until um, today, which is called um, replica knowledge that I do together with the archaeologist Anna Simandiraki Grimshaw and initially this was powered by the um, German Cultural Academic Foundation's Museum Fellowship Program. In this project we were aiming at a comprehensive transdisciplinary case study of the material properties, manifestations and multiform contextual entanglements of replicas of archaeological finds from the Aegean Bronze Age. Um, and we focused on historical and contemporary knowledge transfers. So um, what I would like to introduce here is um, an object that stood at the center of our project. It's the so-called Throne of Minas that was found in 1901 by British archaeologist Arthur Evans at the Palace of Knossos in, in Crete. And over the time, so many replicas of this object were made in many, many different um, contexts. So until today, you find wooden replicas of this object at uh, the Palace of Knossos right next to the original, which is still there um, on site. And Evans himself commissioned a series of wooden replicas that he used for reenactments of what he believed were Minoan rituals and festivities at his own um, house. Even more exciting, we discovered that replicas existed, for example, in the BBC's early Doctor Who series. Um, they, were, they are used at the National Bank in Athens, and um, they made it on a luxury uh, liner ship in the 1930s with a completely an antique-themed um, interior, and most remarkably to us, a marble copy. So I think in, in the first day of this conference, we were talking about the comparison between two objects where one was perfect and the other was timeless. And I think this is the same thing here with the marble copy that has this timeless attribution to it, which is found at the Peace Palace at The Hague, right at the doors of the International Court of Justice. So when we discovered these replicas, we thought, wow, this is really a crazy history. And we were thinking about how do you deal with this in an exhibition concept uh, context, because we discovered this quote by Arthur Evans who said when he discovered the throne, he immediately saw that this was a skeuomorph um, design. So the wooden, the alabaster, not the wooden, the alabaster seat, the original, resembled a wooden object. We thought, ah, okay, this gives us a clue to this whole interplay of, of a material object, but the immaterial concept that even proceeds as an idea, the original. And then you have all these wooden copies, so you have this kind of infinite regression of materialities and immaterialities. So what we um, did was, together with the artist Moritz Wehrmann, um, we were creating what we call a third object, um, kind of an amalgamation uh, and perhaps a virtual contact zone of these materialities by having two objects separated, um, two replicas, the wooden one from private provenance, the family of the descendants of um, Arthur Evans architect, and a copy from the Humboldt University's own Minoan collection made of plaster. And we placed the semi the artist Moritz Wehrmann and I, we placed the semi-transparent spy mirror between them and we would alternatingly light them. So what you could see on the slide before and here again is that visitors could see these materialities overlap each other, creating a kind of virtual object, only that it's not a digital object, but it's still a virtual um, object. And you can gradually see how these materialities interact with each other and you can determine like, okay, um, what works for you? Is the idea first? Is the material first? Uh, where do you find yourself in this endless um, loop? So the third example that I'm going to talk about is from the same project. Um, this is a workshop we did with two artists or designers, Georgie Grace and um, Julia Blumenthal, which was called Making Goddesses, and it was happening right inside the exhibition, so it was a kind of um, 
participatory format with uh, visitors. It has to be said because you will see in a minute that it, it does not come to the level of, um, let's say, technical complexity that we've seen in the last um, days, but we also heard that it requires supercomputers <laughs> and a lot of uh, processing and a lot of expert knowledge. So we're not aiming at this expert knowledge, but rather at a speculative um, dealing with this object. To give you a bit of a background, on these objects that we're dealing with. These are the originals. They are so-called snake goddesses, and they are part of a larger find called the Temple Repositories, which were discovered in 1903, again, at the Palace of Knossos. Um, like other finds, the two faience figurines were found in two sealed containers. So that's for archaeologists. I think it's called closed context. Um, but they were deliberately broken into several pieces. And um, pieces that are now part of a single figurine were spread between the two containers. And some parts were also missing, including the hat that you see here of the smaller goddess. But I get back to this reconstruction in a, um, in a minute. Now, much like with the throne, these, or even more than with the throne, because it, it, they underwent a different form of transformation, they were very, you could say, immensely popular, successful objects. They became iconic and they were used by um, a lot of times in popular culture and souvenir culture also, but what I'm going to show here is that they entered um, they entered contemporary art. So this is an artwork that you can see here on the left-hand side by Marina Abramovic, the biography remix from 2005. And on the right-hand side top, you see a, a really well-known well work, um, which is at the uh, Brooklyn Museum, Judy Chicago, the dinner party from 1974, um, where they are both quoting or in part reenacting this snake goddess. Um, and interestingly enough, of course, Judy Chicago claims that she bases her work on archaeological evidence. So she says all archaeological evidence indicates that these matriarchal cultures were egalitarian, democratic, and peaceful. So that's how she appropriates for her feminist artwork. The question with regard to our topic of materiality and immater immateriality is, what is this archaeological evidence? Is it material evidence or is it immaterial evidence? And if I go on, you can see with a bit, I show you a bit of reconstruction um, history. These are photos taken by Anna Zimandiraki Grimshaw and Faye Stevens at the archives at the Ashmolean Museum in Oxford. And they have done a lot of previous research on their reconstruction. So they discovered, of course, as I said, that the head of the figurine was never found. It was drawn by Halvor Bagge, an, an artist working with Art, Arthur Evans. And this head was, um, uh, it was, afterwards it was called, oh, it's strikingly modern. Well, of course, because it's an invention. But also, not on the physical object, but for publication reasons, the archaeologists tinkered, as you can see here, they, I would call it like they performed a bit of um, plastic surgery on, on the figurine to make her possibly, we don't know, but possibly more imposing in the in the publication. So all that said, we, we believe that the um, these goddesses were really from, when we talk about this before, about um, that we have to imagine things, of course, uh, in archaeology, it's not working otherwise. But the question is, to what an extent can this imagination um, that we learned before should be separated from the data? How can we um, let's say, deal with this if an object like this becomes so iconic that it completely, like, that you lose control of, you cannot create a different reconstruction of this, not just because the parts are glued together, because the narratives are so strong. You cannot question if she's a goddess or if she's a priest or a dancer or any other figurine anymore. And we were trying to elaborate on this in the workshop. So you can see some results where we changed the poses because the arms were also detached. They were, and the snakes were highly disputed. So this is what the artists did. And we discussed this on site with the visitors. Um, and I just continue this um, work slightly when I um, re most recently used AI tools to try to even modify the figurine, but also modify the context that she is set in. These are just a couple of examples, but I think I'm going to explore this um, to explore this further. So what I would and, and the interesting thing is, of course, that AI is not really innovative. You know, it's stereotypical. It, it takes from this repository of what we discussed as the beginning, beginning of this conference, which is like too much information, noise, 
irrelevant information, all the things that we are producing now, but that's exactly how, why AI can contribute to investigating how I not, uh, iconographies sediment and become, you know, what they, uh, what they are. This is why I think it's a good tool in that respect, while in many other respects it, it maybe um, fails. So I would like to really point out or repeat that the iconography of these figurines is an interplay of material and immaterial knowledge of things found and their subsequent reconstruction, and then for further popularization, appropriation, modification, both as objects and images. And this process happens as a materialization of content, of narratives of gender, class, and ancient as much as in modern and contemporary societies and um, communities. So... To go with the time here, um, this is the last example that I'm going to show, and I think it also connects to some topics we have heard um, in the last contribution. This is a project called Ruin in the Reverse by Swedish-Brazilian designer Andrea Malansky, and um, I, I have not been involved in this project, but um, I, I, in 2022 I published a book called Museum Remnants, um, and this, this was her contribution to this uh, volume. So. What she did was basically um, reconstructing um, not monuments, but domestic buildings from Syria. So this was a case study in doing this. And she did it as uh, following the catastrophic destruction of cultural heritage sites in Afghanistan and Syria by extremist terrorists. However, as I said, she did not turn her attention to reconstruct monuments, but instead to rubble from domestic buildings. Um, and in drawing inspiration from a number of theories, Andrea decided not to aim um, yeah, for, for, build, uh, for, for whole buildings or contexts or even single objects, but rather subvert those categories by digitizing only rubble in order to keep it as a repository for many future versions of the rubble and therefore of memory. Um, and I will show you why and how it's a critical example of what digital culture and digitization of heritage sites can achieve. And I think you know this all in terms of restoration, and we've seen these examples today. But at the same time, what is overlooked or even sometimes ignored, and I'm really briefly, because I think we sh I should come to an end pretty close. This is a reconstruction process. Um, show you what she reacted to. So this is a project that I think most of you will also know. It's the reconstruction of the Ark of Palmyra by the Digital, um, uh, Digital Archaeology Institute of the University of um, Oxford. And a lot of um, scholars from uh, Middle Eastern countries, but also globally, have really um, protested this kind of um, reconstruction of the scale model because they said um, this is a kind of like repeating colonial um, approaches because it's a, it's a kind of Western takeover of this heritage um, in a way that only this pastime heritage is uh, acknowledged of Middle Eastern communities, but the present time uh, loss of lives there of buildings, of infrastructures is, um, is ignored at the, at the same time. So I think what and Andrea did with her work was a reaction to that and she, in her own words, she said like, since it's impossible for a restored, reconstructed or copied artifact to function as its original, what ultimately remains is the possibility of producing multiple and diverse versions of the lost uh, or damaged artifact, each carrying its omissions and its emphasis. Would that not be more relevant aim of uh, museums in our contemporary society? And I would like to conclude now um, by traveling from Freud's doppelganger to revisiting a seminal thinker of repetition, Gilles Deleuze. In his dissertation, Repetition and Difference from 1968, he has argued for a multiplicity of knowledge. And uh, he, so I quote Deleuze, in simulacra, repetition already plays upon repetitions and difference already plays upon differences. Repetitions repeat themselves while the differentiator differentiates itself. The task of life is to make all these repetitions coexist in a space in which difference is distributed, end quote. So replicas have long been understood to be representatives that need to be as true to the original as possible. And in their seminal essay, The Migration of the Aura or How to Explore the Original through facsimiles, 
Bruno Latour and Adam Lowe, um, like Faktum Arte was mentioned today as well, have um, demonstrated that originals and especially the aura of originals owes to the copies that affirm their importance and uniqueness. In short, they affirm their identity. And I believe there's this longing for identity now in our cultures, which is understandable, but sometimes it's dangerous. Now, the doppelgangers I have shown work differently. They are actors complementary to this affirmation of identity. They call into question an original narrative of the subject, and by that they seem to be threatening to the subject's identity. However, if this connection between content and its origin is loosened and the doppelgangers can emancipate themselves, they become a productive part of history, a duplication of the past, a duplication of possibilities and identities, or rather, possibilities instead of identities in the best sense of Deleuze. Apart from their obvious institutional critique, this is the aim of these artistic works. Thank you very much.